Martin, multiple universes have moved from philosophy and what would seem to be impossible for science to really access to what seems to be now mainstream science. It's been said that you coined the word multiverse, and I'd like you to talk about the history of this remarkable development. I'm not sure whether I was the first person to use the word multiverse, but certainly I was talking about this concept a very long time ago, and it's interesting it has now become rather more of the uh, scientific mainstream. Um, I think, essentially, the key idea is that there may be a lot more to physical reality than the region we can see with our telescopes. We've seen, in the history of astronomy, expanding horizons from our solar system to our galaxy to the whole uh, 100 billion galaxies visible through our large telescopes. But we've become aware that there's no particular reason to think that's all there is. Indeed, the analogy I like to give is that if you're in the middle of an ocean, you see a horizon around you, but you don't think that the ocean ends mm -hmm. at that horizon. And likewise, there is a horizon around us, a sort of shell, which is delineated by the most distant objects from which light can have reached us in the time since the Big Bang. But there's no reason to think that things end there. Indeed, there are good reasons to think that things go on much further. The best such reason is that if we look as far as we can in one direction and in the opposite direction, Conditions in those two directions don't differ by more than one part in 100,000. And that therefore suggests that if we're part of some huge, vast, but finite structure, then the gradient across it is very gentle mm -hmm. and it goes much, much further. So there are good reasons for thinking that there's a lot more to our universe than the part that we can directly observe. And indeed, that there may be reasons we can't ever observe. And many theories, in particular the theory of inflation, suggests that perhaps this extends far, far further than we might imagine to a distance uh, which involves writing one followed by millions of zeros, <laughs> far, far larger. So in other words, many people believe that the number of powers of 10 upwards is far larger than the number of powers of 10 that get us down to the uh, smallest scale, the so-called Planck length. But of course, even that isn't all, because the other idea is that our Big Bang is not the only one. And what I've talked about so far is the extent of the aftermath of our Big Bang. And there were lots of ideas of which eternal inflation is the most carefully worked out, which suggests that our Big Bang may not be the only one. There may even be an infinity of Big Bangs. And that leads to another issue, which is whether all these domains beyond our horizon and the aftermath of all these other big bangs would lead to domains governed by the same laws as the laws that uh, prevail within the region we can observe. It seems to be the case that the physical laws are the same everywhere we can observe within the volume accessible to our telescopes. There have been attempts to look for very small differences between the spectra of a distant galaxy and the spectrum of a nearby galaxy. But they haven't really found compelling evidence. So the remarkable fact is that the uh, laws governing atoms and gravity seem to be the same in all parts of the universe we can see. But if that's a tiny, tiny fraction of all there is, then, of course, it may well be that in these other domains, different laws prevail. So I think the multiverse idea um, has uh, been taken much more seriously both because ideas involving the multiverse and involving the idea that there's far more to space than what we can directly observe have been taken more seriously by more people. And moreover, string theorists have come up with the idea that perhaps what we call the vacuum may not be unique. Empty space, of course, as we know, is not just emptiness. It has a grainy structure, most people believe, on a tiny, tiny scale, what's called a Planck length, a scale of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, a billion, billion times smaller than the tiniest scale we can directly observe. On that scale, we believe space has a grainy structure, perhaps involving rolled up extra dimensions or something like that. But the important point is that many of the theorists who work on this idea suspect that there could be huge numbers of varieties 
of space. We are in one, but there could be many others. And that therefore suggests that if there are indeed these other domains, these other regions make up the multiverse, then many of them may be governed by quite different laws, where the force of gravity is different, where the cosmic repulsion, uh, the so-called dark energy, has a different strength, and where even the laws of microphysics are different. So this gives us a much grander mm -hmm. conception, which is based on theories which are not yet battle-tested, but which we hope will be put on a firm basis eventually. Can we divide the uh, concept of a multiverse beyond that which we can see into two categories? One, our own universe, but beyond the so-called light cone that we can see, which is really the same universe, but uh, 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 unlimited, perhaps, in its size and, un and uncertain in its size. And other, the other category being those parts of reality which are totally separate universes, generated by different big bangs, by cosmic inflation, whether or not generated by the string theory, different vacua. Are, are those two separate categories that we can think about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting to consider the epistemological status of these domains beyond direct observability. And I like to uh, discuss this by analogy with aversion therapy, you know, where you start off with a, a little spider a long way away and end up with a tarantula crawling all over you. And to make the point that we are used to the idea uh, that there are galaxies beyond the reach, the reach of our telescopes. And uh, we now uh, know that there are galaxies we can't in principle observe now because they're beyond our light horizon. We realize now that we are in a universe which is accelerating and so, whereas we thought that these galaxies, far beyond our present horizon, might eventually come within it if the universe expands but decelerates, we now think we're in a universe which accelerates. So galaxies which are now invisible will forever be invisible. Hmm. So most people, I think, would accept that there are almost certainly galaxies which are part of the aftermath of our Big Bang, which we not merely can't see now, but we'll never see. That's the spider at a distance. Yes, yes, but as the spider gets closer, <laughs> then having uh, accepted that there are galaxies which we will never even in principle be able to observe, which are the aftermath of our Big Bang, is it really a big step further to envisage galaxies or atoms or structures which may be in uh, completely disjoint, disconnected realms of space-time, the aftermath of other Big Bangs? I don't think that's a very big step. So. I think it's important that we can uh, talk in a scientific context about the possibility of things we can't directly observe. Now, people say, well, this will forever be speculation. And the answer I would give to that is that uh, at the moment they're speculative, but that's because we don't understand the underlying physics. 40 or 50 years ago, we didn't understand the physics of the Big Bang at all. Of course, it was debatable whether there was a Big Bang. Now we've got to the stage when the concept of our Big Bang is pretty firmly established back to the first second, the first microsecond probably, because we understand the conditions that prevailed then, and we have observational evidence which allows us to pin down the parameters at that time uh, to uh, one or two decimal places, which is uh, very good going. Now, we don't yet have any battle-tested physics which pertains to the time when we speculate that inflation occurred. This is 10 to minus 36 seconds, etc. But it could be that in the next decade or two, physicists will develop a theory which can be tested in a number of ways and which explains things we can't otherwise explain, like the properties of elementary particles, and which would apply to the universe right back at that time the so-called Grand Unified Era. Now, if we had a theory that had gained credibility by explaining things we could test and which applied back at that early time, then if that theory predicts eternal inflation, we should take that prediction seriously. We don't need to be able to test all the consequences of the theory. To take a simple example, Einstein's theory of general relativity is taken very seriously because it's been tested in many contexts. 
but we can't test it inside a black hole. <laughs> but nonetheless, we believe Einstein's theory does describe the inside of a black hole because we've tested it in other contexts. Likewise, if we had a theory that applied to uh, high densities and high energies, then we would take seriously the possibility that it might predict other domains and other big bangs. <laughs>